Welcome to our talk on adversarial machine learning, where we look at the question how secure machine learning is. My name is Rudolf Meyer, and I will be giving this talk together with my colleague. My name is Tanya Sharcevic, and we are researchers from SBA Research. We are part of machine learning and data management group, and the main focus of our work is security and privacy of machine learning. AI, machine learning, and deep learning are among the most hyped technologies currently. And while there's a lot of hype, there's also tremendous advancements in these technologies that justify the hype. On some tasks, these technologies are surpassing human level performance, and this is mostly based on a number of new learning concepts. There are many application areas, such as autonomous vehicles, medical diagnosis, or machine translation. But one aspect is still rather unexplored, and that's the security of all these technologies. Our talk will take a closer look on the security issues that can arise along the machine learning process. The agenda of our talk is as follows. First, we give a brief overview on the setting on the learning paradigms that we consider. We then detail a couple of attacks that have risen to prominence recently, and we also discuss in detail some of the defenses that you can apply. Let's take a closer look at the typical machine learning workflow. We have broadly speaking two steps. The first step is a training step. This mostly happens offline. And here we want to estimate the model parameters from input data and the according labels, for example, uh, classes that are assigned to it. With this, we obtain the trained model and the model parameters. In the second step, in the prediction step, we want to apply this model on unseen data to get a prediction what is the most likely outcome for that input sample. Here, we want to predict what type of fruit a certain sample is belonging to. In this talk, we specifically consider the classification or categorization machine learning paradigm. In this task, we want to assign to input samples one or more classes from a predefined list of categories. So we have as input data, n-dimensional real number to vectors x, and the output is one of a list of labels. In our case here, we have a binary classification task of classifying fruits either as bananas or apples. And we're basically learning a prediction function f that is separating our input space, forming a decision boundary. There are many different learning paradigms, for example, support vector machines with different types of kernels, multilayer perceptrums, also known as neural networks, and logistic regression. As with many other systems, IT or real life, perfect security is very difficult or maybe sometimes even impossible to achieve. So also for machine learning, the goal we want to achieve is to raise the threshold for an attack to be successful. Basically, we're balancing the cost of protecting our machine learning model against the cost of recovering from an attack. Machine learning models, as other IT systems also, could be subject to attacks on their integrity, availability, or confidentiality. And basically, we have some kind of cycle where adversaries try to break a system, and then maybe the operator or classifier designer is trying to devise defenses that can stop these attacks. So let's now take a closer look on some of the attacks that machine learning models can be subject to. Security of machine learning is in general a rather recent topic. This is also sometimes called adversarial machine learning, and this is a field that deals with attacks on the machine learning process and defenses against those attacks. While maybe the earliest attacks have been publicized already around 15 years ago, it may have been maybe in the last five years that especially adversarial examples have gained a lot of publicity. The reason for this is that machine learning historically was rather focused on optimizing the accuracy and the generalization power, so basically making machine learning predictions work, becoming effective. And security was simply not a major topic. It was most of the times assumed that training data would come from natural and well-behaved distributions, which doesn't generally hold in security-sensitive settings. Adversaries were mostly not considered. Let's now revisit our machine learning pipeline to see when the process attacks could happen. 
we can broadly distinguish between attacks in the training or in the prediction phase. In the prediction phase, this could be for example so-called evasion attacks, where an adversary tries to avoid having a sample classified as what it really is. In the training phase, we would like to do for example a poisoning attack, which would allow us to embed a backdoor in the trained machine learning model. And finally, there are a number of attacks that would directly target the model itself, so just doing some inference on the model to recreate information about training data or to actually steal or kind of make a copy of an existing machine learning model. Adversarial examples are one prominent form of an evasion attack. Here, the adversary is trying to fool the model in the prediction step. This is done by adding a minimal perturbation to an input, which would lead to misclassification. These perturbations are often not perceptible to human vision because they're really minimal. This means in practice, if you look at our data set here in the top right, that if you want to add a small perturbation to this green apple, it would then in the end cross across the decision boundary and come to rest on the other side and therefore get misclassified. Adversarial examples are very effective and robust attack. Small perturbations are normally sufficient for a successful attack. And these not only apply to deep neural networks, where they have most prominently been shown, but also to other classifiers, such as support vector machines or random forests. And they're robust and resistant against certain types of conversions. For example, if I'm printing out that adversarial example and then scan it again, so I do a digital analog and digital conversion, even for it was maybe not even perceptible to human vision, the perturbation is still persisted. These type of attacks in principle attack the integrity of the prediction and therefore of the whole machine learning process. Let's take a look at a simple example. We have here one input from a dataset on handwritten digits. We see here the number seven on the left hand side, the original image on the right hand side, the modified adversarial example that has some perturbation. Granted, on this image, the perturbation is not minimal and not noticeable, but this is mostly because the dataset has rather small images and only black and white. And also the attack that you see here is not the most powerful attack. How is the attack executed? The attacker needs to be able to query the model, so to send samples to the model and observe the output, either the predicted class or ideally more information about probabilities of predicted classes. A very simple approach could be a greedy search of trying to simply change random pixels and then see if this leads to modification of the prediction. In practice, more advanced techniques are employed, for example, the fast gradient science method, which tries to obtain information about the gradient, so into what direction pixels need to be changed based on the output of the prediction of the model. More advanced methods like the iterative fast gradient science, or especially Caldini and Wagner method, they try to really minimize the amount of perturbation that is introduced, but they also take longer to compute. On the bottom, we see a couple of different examples. So we see here actually all the, all the digits in the data set, and then you see different approaches, so the fast gradient sign, iterative fast gradient sign, and Caldini and Wagner method that provide you with adversarial example versions of these uh, handwritten digits. And you would see that, especially the Kalini and Wagner version, the perturbations are very uh, unnoticeable. Let's look at a slightly more complex data set. This is an example of an image depicting a horse from the so-called Cypher 10 data set, which has 10 classes, the names that you can see here in the bottom depicted. And what we basically did here is we took the horse as the one input image and all the nine other images that you can see, they're basically adversarial example versions of this one input image, but each time targeted to a different class. So the second image would be classified by the classifier as an airplane. And then the third image, the classifier would think this is an automobile and the fourth image, a bird and so on and so forth. To us humans, there's no visible or perceive, uh, perceivable modification in these images, but the classifier is successfully fooled. And the second example from the same data set, this is an airplane, and then also the classifier thinks that the uh, more or less unmodified or maybe slightly modified in the background image 
is a different class, so a car or a dog. Now you might be wondering what is actually the threat here. So far I have shown you examples where classifier is maybe not able to correctly identify a panda from a gibbon and it's maybe not the best case for your automatic photo categorization application that you might employ. But the real threat to safety or other aspects is maybe not really present here. But if you think about other domains, for example, if you think about autonomous vehicles, that would rely on a classifier being able to recognize correctly what traffic signs are on the road, this can become a serious threat. You have here an example where instead of a stop sign, the classifier would recognize a priority sign and then maybe not take the correct action and stop at a crossroad but continue driving and then maybe cause an accident. Or if you think about IT security, you might have a machine learning algorithm that is able to detect or supposedly able to detect malware, but if the malware is able to kind of cloak itself by doing a slight modification, then the classifier would not be able to recognize and think it's a benign application. Now I would like to show you um, a simulation of adversarial attacks on, uh, on this image. Um, image recognition classifier. So with images, we can actually demonstrate it visually very well. Uh, here we can choose our input image, for example, a cup of coffee, and we can see how the classifier uh, predicts it. So in this case, it's predicted as a cup with 73% of confidence. Now the adversary would want to change this prediction into something else while applying some um, a minimal modification to the input image. So for example, we can simulate here the uh, apl application of, uh, of some attack, for example, fast gradient method, and see how the prediction actually changed uh, to soup bowl with a very high confidence. Uh, in the same time, I hope you can see this over the video, but uh, the original image and modified image are quite similar, so there is no a significant difference uh, visible to a human observer. However, uh, the attacker managed to trick the classifier and obtain uh, a wrong classification for this image. Okay, good. Now, when we identified and demonstrated the adversarial attacks, let's talk about how to defend our models against this type of attack. Um, generally speaking, and this holds for all types of attacks on machine learning, uh, is that there is no one recipe uh, to follow or one time uh, defense application that uh, we can do to solve all our problems. But rather, as um, also in the context of cybersecurity in general, the attacker is adaptive and the attacker is getting smarter and more informed and capable. Therefore, the defense needs to, needs to evolve with that. Um, that's why I would like to say that uh, defense is an arms race against the adversary. Um, so the adversary has uh, some kind of advantage because um, first of all, they decide which data they present to the model. Um, also, it's hard to verify all the data points either from the training or prediction phase. And um, another thing is that also sanitizing them can, sanitizing the data can be uh, very hard to do in a meaningful way. Um, usually, the adversary also has uh, direct access to the model, so to the model's parameters, uh, which is yet another surface for the attack. Um, the defenses usually, and if not always, come with a cost of effectiveness of the service or with a cost of user experience, because defense usually means that um, we need to either modify the data in some way or modify the model in uh, model internally to avoid attacks. But um, I think this will be much easier uh, to to show uh, on on a concrete examples that we will have uh, through this presentation. Um, the defenses can in general be classified as operational, for example, controlling the access to the model, so who accesses it and in which way, uh, or integrated, where we actually modify the functionality of a model in some way. 
Uh, one of the concrete defense strategies against adversarial attack is uh, to produce a classifier that would be robust against adversarial attack. Um, we do that by proactively generating adversarial inputs and making them part of the training set. So the classifier actually learns the adversarial inputs and then it should be robust when they are fed to the classifier at the prediction step. Um, the downside, uh, downside of this strategy is that uh, this can actually impact the performance on the clean samples. Um, but this is really effective if uh, adversary uses some anticipated uh, attack algorithms such as uh, fast gradient sign method or uh, Carlini Wagner. Um, another approach for the defense against the adversarial attack would be uh, cleaning the data inputs in the prediction phase. For example, applying some image filtering or passing it through an autoencoder. And uh, with this pre-processing step, we want to remove the uh, we want to remove the embedded adversarial pattern. Uh, let's go back to our demo from before and show uh, the defense against adversarial input. As I mentioned before, defense strategy can be to apply some image manipulation uh, before feeding uh, the inputs to the model. So we can as well um, simulate that here. We have uh, three different uh, defense strategies and we can, uh, we can see how they would uh, perform in this case. Um, so for example, applying Gaussian noise does not seem to help a lot. Um, spatial smoothing, however, helps. And we can see that our classifier uh, predicts correctly this cup again, however, with uh, quite lower um, confidence level, but, um, but it seems like the adversarial uh, behavior is removed. Um, what is important to uh, notice here as, is that the defense mechanism uh, also changes uh, the image, uh, the input image. So we need to make sure that the classifier still performs well, even with this defense. Um, we need to make sure uh, of that because we are applying the defense to every single input image. We don't know if the input image is contains the adversarial uh, modification or not. So we can also simulate this on, um, on a clean image. I will try to, um, okay, so we have a clean uh, input image here and we apply um, some defense strategy and we can see how the confidence actually uh, degrades. Uh, but the good thing is that the, the prediction is still correct. Uh, this demo is part of the adversarial robustness toolbox from uh, IBM research. Uh, and I'm leaving the link in the presentation so you can actually try it out yourself. Um, this toolbox implements a lot of different attack strategies, a lot of different defenses. So it's really nice to experiment with. And also in this demo, uh, everything that is visually represented here that we uh, simulated up to now, it can also be seen as the underlying code, um, which actually this toolbox makes just in a, in a couple of lines. So it's really uh, friendly for experimentation. Now let's look at a different type of attack against the machine learning process. Let's look at poisoning and backdoor attacks. In this type of attack, the attacker is trying to permanently compromise the learned model. So basically to perform an attack during the training process to make sure that there's a permanently embedded backdoor in the resulting model. This is normally achieved by manipulating some of the inputs and therefore creating a poisoned version of the training data set. This is generally done for one class that you want to specifically misclassify, could also be done for multiple classes. For. And normally it's sufficient to manipulate a small percentage of those samples, could be as small as 1%, but in some settings you might need to go as high as up to manipulating 50% of the samples. Basically what the attacker needs to perform is, as you can see here on the digit again, embed a certain pattern. This does not need to be a pattern that is not perceptible, but needs to be a distinct pattern that is maybe not 
causing any suspicion. For this attack to work, the attacker requires access to either the training data or the model at some point. And one type of attack or one point of attack could be somewhere in the supply chain of the machine learning process. So for example, this could be done when we perform a training in the cloud, maybe then it's possible to manipulate the training data or another type of attack could be if you're reusing a pre-trained model in the so-called transfer learning setting, if there's already a backdoor embedded there, this might survive quite some of the model fine tuning that you normally do afterwards. Again, the poisoning and backdoor attacks kind of lead to a drop in the integrity of the model, but contrary to an evasion attack where we modified certain inputs to move them across the decision boundary, what we're trying to do here is that we're actually changing the position boundary permanently. Let's take a closer look what actually happens inside a backdoor neural network. This is sometimes also called BadNet literature. Here you see two neural networks depicted with the same structure, but the one on the top is a benign network that has not been manipulated with, and the bottom one is the manipulated BadNet that has been trained on the poison dataset. Due to this manipulation in the training process, if we send in a clean input, there's actually no observable differences. Both of the networks predict correctly the number seven because the input was not manipulated. Both networks should behave like correct prediction. However, however, if during the prediction step, we're providing the networks with a manipulated input that has the same type of backdoor pattern embedded that we have poisoned our data during the training process with, the two networks will behave differently. So here we have again a number seven, but it has this small backdoor pattern in the bottom right. The benign network will not be influenced by this and still predict the correct uh, prediction, so the number seven, while the BATnet is kind of recognizing this backdoor pattern and is now triggering the behavior that has been trained, so it's predicting wrongly the class number eight. Experimental evaluation has shown that in many settings, such backdoor attacks can be very effective without actually causing much side effects here, without actually causing much drop in classification accuracy on clean samples. We see here, again, on the handwritten digit, a number seven that is backdoored with either a single pixel pattern or a slightly more complex pattern. And in the evaluation, we can see that the errors introduced by even manipulating up to 50% of the samples from this class seven are very minor, so half a percent approximately. And the backdoors that we are creating, they're almost triggered in all the cases. So in 99.5% of the cases, the backdoor at prediction time is actually triggered correctly. Now let's consider a realistic threat scenario again. Imagine an adversary would like to tamper with an autonomous vehicle by embedding a backdoor into the traffic sign recognition engine of that vehicle. Basically, the attacker embeds a backdoor there, which in this case is based on a backdoor symbol that is noticeable, but just not suspicious. So unlike an evasion attack, where the manipulation or modification should be not perceivable, here it can be noticeable, it just should not be suspicious. If you were now actually in Vienna listening to this talk and you could afterwards go out on the street and take a look, you would actually see that on most traffic signs in Vienna, you would actually see some kind of stickers on it. They're hopefully not all backdoors, they're just other political messages sometimes or just other messages that people leave there. So people are used to having stickers or other uh, items attached to traffic signs, so such a manipulation would actually not be very suspicious. However, it can extremely fool the classifier and the classifier, instead of being able to predict here stop sign, would predict a speed limit sign and then the autonomous vehicle would not stop at the uh, intersection anymore, but maybe just continue driving and potentially cause an accident. And you might now be wondering why do backdoors actually work? And this is due to a peculiarity of many machine learning models because many models in general have simply too much memory capacity. So they're able to pick up too many details and maybe sometimes even the unimportant details. If you look at the example of a neural network and you would compare how a neural network acts on a clean sample seen on the left side 
and on the back dot sample, seeing the middle side, and then actually on the differences in what happens in the activations in these samples, you would see that there's a couple of neurons or some dedicated neurons that really pick up this pattern that is embedded. So in our case, maybe the yellow post-it. So they're kind of overfitting to the specific, maybe unimportant detail. They're memorizing it by heart. And when this detail appears again on another sample, these neurons get active and they kind of trigger that wrong classification. So you could kind of say that some parts of the brain of the model basically really trained to just recognize that backdoor pattern. Now an important question is, can we actually defend against such poisoning and backdoor attacks? One defense, for example, is based on the observation that I've just shown you before, that some of the neurons are dedicated to learning the specific backdoor patterns. If you are able to remove those backdoor neurons from the model, then the model in effect is a normal benign model that is not able to recognize the pattern anymore and therefore is also not going to be manipulated. So a defender is going to prune these neurons and basically a defender is going to prune neurons that are not active when passing through clean samples. So here you would need a another data set, a validation data set, where you're sure that there are no manipulations in there, so there's no poisoned images is there. If you have that and you can pass that through, you could basically cut everything out that has not been used to classify these samples correctly. Here we have an example for a face recognition task, where the model has been manipulated by certain types of glasses that are put on people as a kind of backdoor pattern or backdoor key. This could even be a physical key that people put on and then they could trigger a wrong classification in an authentication system, for example. Now, based on the assumption that some specific neurons are kind of responsible for the trigger and having a clean validation set available, we can cut out a number of neurons from the, the network. And basically what we're doing here is we're saying that we're going to accept a certain drop in accuracy on classifying correctly the clean samples. Here, for example, the target is set to we accept a 4% drop in accuracy on clean classification tasks. In the figure in the bottom, you would see basically the success rate in red of the backdoor and the success rate of the classifier on the normal task of correctly identifying the unmodified images. And we can observe that when we start to cut out neurons, also the performance on the clean classification images task uh, starts to drop. But there's a certain sweet spot where we're actually able to perfectly disable the backdoor and the original classification task still works well. So when we cut out around 70% of the neurons in this network, so that's quite a large number of the actual model capacity that we're removing. We're not losing much in performance yet. Here, maybe just even 1% or 2%. We set it to the goal of losing at most 4%. And at this threshold, we're actually able to completely disable the backdoor, and the backdoor doesn't work at all anymore. So the defense is very effective in this case. And it's also quite efficient because we're not losing a lot of accuracy on the clean task. Now let's come back to an example of the traffic signs from before. We see here a similar evaluation. We see that initially the backdoor has around 100% effectiveness. And when we start to prune our model, we remove neurons. We first manage to reduce the effectiveness to around 85%. And then when we, when we remove around 80% of the neurons, we reduce it further to around 40%. But if you would like to completely disable the backdoor, we basically need to prune almost all the neurons, or at least 95, 97% of the neurons, to get to zero effectiveness of the backdoor. But at that stage, we've also basically disabled the functionality of the network for also the clean classification task, because we also reach around 0% classification on clean input samples. This means that the attack is still effective to some extent. And if you can consider that maybe the attacker is able to manipulate five traffic signs, so there's five times a 40% chance that the classifier will be wrong, this might still be enough to cause an accident or some other kind of malfunctioning in the autonomous vehicle and the attacker has achieved the goal. 
Now let's speak about the attacks against data and model confidentiality. There are attacks that are targeting the confidentiality of training data. For example, a membership inference attack is, um, is a malicious strategy to identify whether or not a sample was used to train a specific machine learning model. Um, one scenario where this would be especially undesired is, for example, a data set with cancer patients as participants. Um, model inversion is another attack that is targeting uh, the training data, and there the adversary tries to use the model to recover the training data. Uh, a really good example of that is um, attack attack on a face recognition model where the adversary's goal is to reconstruct input data for a specific person. Um, and here we actually see some of um, almost successful or even successful examples of inversion attack. So it's not really a perfect uh, reconstruction of a face, but um, it would most likely be, the person from the reconstructed image would most likely be uh, recognized by a human. One of the attacks that tries to exploit the intellectual property rights of the model, uh, model creators is a model stealing attack. Uh, since Training the model from scratch can be um, can be very expensive because for that one would need the significant computer power and also a lot of training data. So those are the resources that are not so easy to obtain. And the adversary may try to learn a close approximation of some model that is openly available in as few queries as possible to try to. The models that are susceptible to uh, to this type of attack are cloud services uh, or so-called AI as a service models, where the users can actually pay to query a model. Uh, for example, um, who offers that are Amazon uh, with uh, IFS uh, cloud platform or uh, Google AI, uh, Microsoft Azure uh, and, and others. So how can we defend against model stealing attacks? One method that is not necessarily stopping the model theft, but um, rather enabling the verification of the model owner is called model watermarking. The idea of watermarking is that the owner marks a model using their signature, so to say, and then they make the model openly available. Now, if, if there is a suspicion that the model has been stolen and used without authorization, with this signature, the owner uh, is actually able to verify their ownership over a model. This signature is called watermark in this context, and uh, watermark is essentially some design modification or addition to the model. For example, uh, watermark can be the pattern of small changes in the model parameters, if we are talking about neural networks. Um, and to extract this kind of watermark um, and prove the ownership, the owner would need a full access to the suspicious model. Uh, this is so-called white bo box access, so that's why we call this strategy a white box watermarking. Another type of watermark can be a predefined set of adversarial inputs that the owner uh, purposely trains their model on so, so that when, when they query these specific inputs to the trained model, uh, the owner gets a desired output. And with this, they can prove the ownership. Uh, this is quite interesting now because we are using the adversarial inputs as an actual defense strategy. Um, so we can see that for this type of defense, the owner does not need the full access to the model, but only needs to be able to query the model to, to successfully extract the watermark. Uh, and this, um, this kind of access is called black box access. So that's why this uh, watermark is called black box uh, watermark. Okay, then it's time to wrap up our talk and provide some conclusions. 
So the major takeaway is that machine learning really needs to consider security and also privacy aspects because machine learning models can get easily fooled and can easily exploit it. We've shown a few attacks that can compromise the confidentiality and the integrity, but also the availability of the models. There are many potential attack points for an adversary and we need to consider the whole supply chain. So even when we use, for example, machine learning as a service or when we do transfer learning from existing models, there might be adversaries there and they will be there if the application becomes important enough. We are now happy to answer any questions that you might have and we would also like to encourage you to go to our group's website and check out uh, other topics that we are dealing with in area of security and privacy in machine learning. Thank you very much for your attention.